Welcome to This Week in Hearing, where listeners find the latest information on hearing and hearing care. Hello, I'm Bob Trainer. I'm your host for this episode of This Week in Hearing. Today, my guest is an old friend and colleague whom many of you know as a fellow host here at This Week in Hearing. Dr. Brian Taylor is currently the Senior Director of Audiology at Signia Hearing, but has worn many hats over his 31 year career in our field. Thanks for being with me today, Brian. Uh, well, I can use all the help I can get in this host chair. And I know that, uh, that we've both kind of sat here and interacted over, over the last few months. Yeah, it's great to be with you. And it's nice not to have to push the record button and let somebody else do it. For the <laughs> well, uh, for, for our colleagues, uh, many of us know us, but many of us don't know us. And uh, at this interview, uh, Dr. Taylor has five books on everything from private practice, although you know we have a little bit of a conflict on a private practice textbook because we both have <laughs> one out at the same time, but that's okay. They, they kind of complement each other from what we can tell. I'd like to think so. And, uh, but in addition to practice, he has textbooks out in hearing aids and marketing and counseling and a number of other topics. He's also run large audiology clinics, uh, been the main audiologist for major buying groups. As, and, um, and as many of us know, um, we are, uh, is one of our hosts here at This Week in Hearing. And he tells me there are some distinct chapters in hearing aid development that are all fundamental to our everyday practice of the profession. He feels there's some, some stuff that goes all the way back to 1946. Well, that's a long ways back. Uh, <laughs> and the Harvard report and some of Carhartt's research, as well as uh, the big transition into the digital age, uh, where he wants to give us some updates and some things that were specific from Vilcher and Killian and wide dynamic range compression, as well as, believe it or not, to our younger colleagues, there were days when there wasn't multi-memory, there wasn't programmability, and directional microphones were kind of a kind of a rudimentary kind of technology, and uh, Brian's going to update us there. Also, the huge transition to receiver in the canal products, and then guess what? The one of the biggest ones was wireless connectivity that happened here a few years ago. Now, before we begin, uh, Brian and I talked about this a little bit, and. We would like to recognize the fact that Dr. Raymond Carhart was probably one of the, the most progressive audiologists ever to practice the profession as the father of our, of our profession. And to, to, give, to give Carhart credit is for, for realizing that clinical audiology would be a, a, a mainstay of the audiology profession. Here's something he wrote in 1975. Now keep in mind, this was way before all the uh, uh, sexist language and so on. Try to read through that, but listen to how he predicts where audiology was going in the mid 1970s. So here's a quote, Dr. Raymond Carhart. The researcher can gather fact after fact at his leisure until he has sufficient ed edifice of evidence to answer his question with surety. How different is the clinician's task? He too is an investigator. But the question before him is, what can I do now about the needs of the person who's seeking my help at this moment? The clinician proceeds to gather as much data as possible about his client as he can in a clinically reasonable period of time. He does not have the luxury to wait several months or years for other facts to appear. 
the decisions of the clinician are more daring than the decisions of the researcher because human needs that uh, require attention today impel clinical decisions to be made more rapidly and on a basis of evidence that do that then do research decisions. The dedicated and conscientious clinician should bear this fact in mind proudly. And as Carhart sums it up, his is the greater courage. So with that as an orientation from the father of our profession, Brian, uh, it's now time for your encore, which would be discussing Dr. Carhart and his, uh, uh, some of his research to begin. Sure, uh, well, I think a good way to start with uh, Raymond Carhart is to, is to say that he, he's a lot more famous than just the uh, Forrest Notch. I think most uh, audiologists are familiar uh, with Carhart's Notch, something that you see with otosclerosis. Um, but he was a real pioneer with respect to hearing aids. Uh, you have a quote from 1975 I know that um, he did some pioneering work back in 1946 uh, around uh, the term uh, selective amplification, something that we kind of take it, uh, for granted today. Uh, we talk about the prescriptive fitting methods, the NAL, the DSL, every manufacturer has a first fit formula. Uh, they're all, they all are really based on this concept of selective amplification, which essentially is uh, the gain mirrors, uh, inversely mirrors, I guess, the audiogram. Uh, uh, so the greater the hearing loss at a particular threshold, the more gain. And uh, DSL, NAL, and many, many others that go back uh, to the 1940s and probably before that um, called for different amounts of gain. But it's all uh, predicated around this idea of mirroring the audiogram and selective amplification. And uh, actually there's a really, I think, excellent summary of this that was written by another uh, father, the father of the American Academy of Audiology, that's Dr. James Jerger. Uh, he wrote a really interesting piece in the hearing review about three, I wanna say three years ago, I think it was in 2018, uh, that talked about this important uh, year, 1946, uh, where Carhartt kind of introduced this concept of selective amplification um, and it was, he introduced the concept of selective amplification kind of in the face of what some people know as the Harvard report, which actually I think was created by a bunch of researchers at the uh, Psychoacoustic Laboratory in Har at Harvard University and uh, in, in conjunction with some researchers at Central Institute for the Deaf in St. Louis, which basically said, uh, you know, provide all people with a hearing loss, mild, moderate, maybe moderate, severe, with the same gain and frequency response, a flat frequency response, kind of a one size fits all approach works well for everybody. And that was the consensus in 1946. And Carhartt, I think, kind of stood up and said, well, my research says something a little different. You need to mirror the audiogram, uh, provide more gain in the highs, assuming there's more hearing loss in the highs. And like I said, all these prescriptive formulas kind of arose from that concept. Um, so that's the importance of, 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 of Raymond Carhart uh, and selective amplification. Uh, you know, I think if you if you then kind of go from there, uh, you know, maybe move the clock ahead another 20 years or so to the 1970s, um, I think you can split the uh, hearing aid uh, world into probably four or five distinct eras. Um, a lot of our listeners, our viewers probably aren't familiar with uh, a really important audio engineer by the name of Edgar Vilcher. Uh, he did some pioneering work in the area of ported speakers. If you like to listen to music uh, on a small speaker with good sound quality, uh, that kind of uh, speaker uh, was actually invented, or at least one of the inventors was Edgar Vilcher. Uh, he should probably be more well known in audiology than he is. Uh, he is one of the inventors of wide dynamic range compression, applying more gain for soft sound to kind of mimic the function of a normal cochlear, less gain as uh, input levels uh, increase. Um, he did that work in the early 70s 
And that was included in hearing aids, uh, starting with Resound about 10 years later. And now I think fundamentally, all digital hearing aids uh, have some form of wide dynamic range compression. Uh, another work, another important person, I think mo most of our viewers probably know uh, that fits into this era of WDRC in the 70s and 80s is Mead Killian, uh, the inventor of the K-Amp, uh, similar concept there, uh, less gain uh, as is applied as uh, input levels uh, are increased. So that's kind of the first era, I think, of the modern hearing aid is around uh, WDRC. You could also probably throw in there directional microphone technology. I think directional microphone technology, it had been around for an awful long time, uh, 1960s at least, uh, but it didn't become really commercially viable until probably the late 80s and early 90s. Um, it had some issues with noise floor and stuff like that it being too much, too loud. Uh, but some of our viewers might remember the audio zoom from Phonak. That was one of the first, in my opinion, really good directional microphone systems in the, I guess, early 90s. Uh, there were some others as well. Uh, but that's kind of the first era of modern hearing aids. And then um, that takes us into maybe the mid 90s when digital signal processing kind of became the rage, uh, the era of digital hearing aids, uh, mid 90s through the early uh, 2000s. And of course, with that, you get all kinds of programmability, uh, you throw away your screwdriver, make the adjustments with your software. So there's a level of precision. And, uh, you know, I think most of us would agree, digital hearing aids back then didn't have very good sound quality. But man, have they improved over the last uh, couple of decades, uh, we can fit a much greater range of hearing losses, uh, sound quality is better, noise floor is better, flexibility, uh, all kinds of things you can do. Uh, then I think we move into the era of receiver in the canal technology. Uh, individuals like Natan Bauman, who kind of put that on the map, uh, you know, that opened up a lot of possibilities around smaller, uh, uh, smaller devices, more comfortable, more, uh, more instant fit kinds of uh, devices. Um, so there's all kinds of, I think, advantages to the wear around RICs. That moves us into the era of wireless connectivity. Uh, where you see the hearing aid starting to become uh, paired with uh, smartphone technology, Bluetooth, um, uh, Bluetooth connectivity, the ability to improve the signal to noise ratio stream directly from a phone, uh, from a computer, from a TV uh, that has all kinds of advantages. And now I think uh, we're moving into, we're kind of leaving that era, not that it, it's still obviously wireless connectivity is important, and it's still probably some areas there that need to be enhanced. Uh, but we're moving into a new era, which I kind of call uh, the era of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and even though that kind of AI and machine learning have been around for a long time and hearing aids, I mean, in the Signia world, we've had trainable hearing aids for about 15 years, and that's a type of machine learning. But I think it's really starting to become more sophisticated, more user-friendly. And what AI and machine learning, I think, really allow is for um, self-programming, self-adjustment, self-fitting devices. It puts more control, meaningful control, in the hands of the wearer, uh, where they can access their hearing aid through a smartphone app and make all kinds of really, you know, individualized adjustments if they want to do that. Uh, so that's kind of how I think of the modern hearing aid world, those four or five distinct eras. Uh, since the 1970s. So lots of, uh, you know, it's amazing. Uh, and you can look at the market track uh, data on this, I think, too. Uh, hearing aid satisfaction 30 years ago was around 60, maybe 65 percent. And uh, the last market track published a year or two ago, market track 10, overall satisfaction was in the mid to upper um, 80s. So that kind of shows you, um, you know, a combination of of better technology, uh, incrementally improving technology, and also the skill uh, of the hearing care professional, how they go kind of go hand in hand to drive that number. So I don't know, Bob, did you have any uh, feedback on my long-winded uh, <laughs> history of hearing aids? <laughs> no, actually, uh, uh, all that stuff is great reminders. And uh, I know you and I remember when we use screwdrivers, but there's a whole lot of colleagues out there these days who 
don't ever remember using a hearing aid screwdriver. And I mean, that's how I started wearing glasses is my office manager. Uh, one day I was trying to, trying to turn the, the screw on a output control and I was having a hard time getting the screwdriver in there. And says, why don't you get yourself some damn glasses? And you're, oh yeah, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the idea is that uh, there's a, been a whole lot of changes as, as, as all of us have progressed in our career. And, and now you have some speculations as to the kinds of things that are going to happen in the next few years for our for our new colleagues that are out uh, uh, basically becoming Carhartt's uh, clinicians as he presented uh, this uh, long ago. Well, I think the, the field of auditory science to pay attention to right now is uh, auditory scene analysis. Um, it's a field of auditory science that's been around for a while. But I think you're going to start to see hearing aids that more closely mimic what uh, auditory scene analysis experts have been telling us about how uh, we hear and how we understand in complex listening situations. Um, you know, I think most of our viewers in audiology are probably familiar with how the auditory system works in a top down and a bottom up manner. Uh, auditory scene analysis is, is a big, is really the underpinning under the theory that underpins that. Um, it talks about how we, uh, how people uh, search, uh, process uh, information. And uh, I think you're going to start to see hearing aids that kind of mimic that automated uh, auditory scene analysis process that we all innately have, which is pretty exciting. So you see some of this stuff transitioning into the into the over-the-counter products as well as into self-fittings and DT uh, direct to consumers and those kinds of things as well. Yeah, well, I think that um, one of the really cool things about machine learning is that you can take the you can take data from thousands of other fittings that are held up in the cloud held there, you know, anonymized data. You don't know the name or the person, but you know that, you know, maybe their audiogram and you know their, 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 uh, their fitting parameters, what they're using. And a person with, a, with an app can interact with those thousands of data points, see what those people have done in certain situations. Let's say a noisy environment, a cocktail party. Uh, they don't want to, they want to maybe tweak the hearing aid well, maybe rather than going to their audiologist to have the audiologist, um, you know, based on all of their experience, uh, make adjustments to the hearing aid, they can take those thousands of data points from similar wares, and it's all combined into one spot, uh, takes the average and gives the patient a couple of options as far as how they might want to adjust their own hearing aid based on how those other thousands of people around the world uh, have adjusted their hearing aid in a similar situation. So that's an exciting possibility for, uh, and of course, not all hearing aid wearers probably want that, but for those that want to you know, take the time to individualize the fitting on their own, I think that's a, a pretty powerful uh, tool that they would have just on their phone. Wow. So, uh, so now, do, do, does, has Cygnia, does Cygnia have some kinds of technologies that fit into some of the parameters that we've been we've been discussing here? Uh, Signia has a feature called Signia Assistant that does pretty much what I just described that allows the patient um, to make adjustments based on uh, thousands of other uh, similar uh, wares when they've been in that same situation. Um, it's, it's something that the provider has to uh, enable. So the patient just doesn't do this on their own. The provider has to be involved in the process of kind of turning the controls over to the patient. And inside that app, there's some, it, it's, it's locked down to a certain extent. Of, so they, they can only adjust it a, a certain amount. It doesn't give them complete control. Like that would be too unwieldy for anybody, but it gives them some options to choose from uh, sort of off a menu when they go into a, certain places that are notorious for needing adjustments. They can look what other people have done 
base and then um, make an adjustment on their device based on that other information. Isn't it interesting that, you know, back when, when I started in audiology, it was a little bit kind of like, hi, how does that sound? And, uh, and guess what? Here we are 40 some years later, and we're now back to, uh, uh, can you tell me how that sounds? Uh, <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of coming full circle to some degree. Uh, you're right about that. I think that's really an interesting comment because you know, there's nothing wrong with going to see the provider, the audiologist, the hearing care professional to make those adjustments. I mean, they have tons of experience. They've seen lots of patients, but the advantage, uh, that's one person's opinion, basically, albeit an expert opinion. But when you can take thousands of data points from, you know, literally dozens or hundreds of wares that are very similar to you, the individual, I think that takes it to another level of precision. It does. And uh, well, I, I guess I'm, we're, we're kind of at a point where, where we've pretty well, we've discussed uh, hearing aids all the way back from 1946 until now, and uh, in, in a relatively short period of time. So those of you who were looking for a summary of hearing aids from this period, guess what? It's right here. And uh, so I, I really want to thank Brian for being with me today at This Week in Hearing. And, uh, and it's always good to, uh, to have a colleague that we can kind of go back and forth with a little bit. And you're not worried about, oh, gee, did I say the right thing or did I not say the right <laughs> thing? And maybe I didn't, but that's OK, uh, because we can always laugh about it later. But uh, thanks so much for being with me today, Brian, on This Week in Hearing. Yeah, my pleasure, Bob. Thanks for having me.